The Great Sphinx is a pretty iconic ancient Egyptian statue sitting right next to the Great Pyramids in Giza near Cairo. Head of a human, body of a lion, loads of sand. You know the one. It's one of the only two surviving seven wonders of the world alongside those pyramids. But did you know it's not actually called the Great Sphinx? Its head is really weird. It's haunted a pharaoh's dreams and it wasn't always smack in the middle of the desert. You will after this video. I'm Obi, this is Tut, and we're in Tut's world now. So when you think of ancient Egypt, you think of the pyramids, pharaohs, hot deserts, and the Sphinx. And Cleopatra. Oh my god, Tut, will you stop banging on about her? All know you've got the hots for Cleo, even if she wasn't actually that gorgeous. Check out the video linked to the top right now for more on that particular topic. But if you had a time machine, went back to ancient Egypt, and asked for directions to the Great Sphinx, the locals would look at you gone out. That'll probably be the fact that you're standing there in your skinny jeans, sunglasses, and holding a Starbucks and an iPhone. They think you're a devil. Or a foreigner. Same thing. Uh, my point being, Tutmosis Chaddington III, that they wouldn't actually know what you were talking about. The Sphinx wasn't called a Great Sphinx back then. A text dating to 1400 BC refers to the statue of Kepi, which is believed to be talking about the Sphinx, and later it became known as Horum Arket, or Horus in the Horizon, after a pharaoh had a dream about it. But more on that later in the video. The ancient Egyptians probably wouldn't have even called it a Sphinx even. That actually comes from the Greek word Sphingo, meaning to squeeze, as the Greek Sphinx strangled anyone who failed to answer his riddle. I got a riddle for you. Go on. What has five toes and isn't your foot? Hmm. I don't know. My foot. Oh, Tut, that was awful. Like, really bad, even for you. Would have still got you strangled. So the Great Sphinx wasn't called the Great Sphinx till about 2,000 years after it's thought to have been built. And because of the limited material from that time, we actually have no idea what the locals would have called it themselves. Later on down the line, Arab scholars referred to it as Belhib, Belhuba, and Bel Hawaii, which came from the ancient Egyptian word Pelor, their name for a Canaanite god Horon. Neither of which sound like Belhib, frankly. But scholars gonna scholar make up some mad shit every now and again just for the lols. So we don't know what it was called, but surely we know who built it. Was it aliens? Have you been talking to Hecklefish again? No, it was not aliens. The most widely accepted theory is that it was built during the reign of Carfrey, since the Sphinx's face resembles Carfrey's face. This would place the statue's build date around two and a half thousand years BC. Carfrey was the son of Khufu, the pharaoh who built the biggest pyramid at Giza. Carfrey got the throne after his brother, Jedifrey. Jeffrey. No, Jedifrey. Why, what did I say? Carfrey also built the second pyramid at Giza and a temple complex surrounding the place. However, some folks think the Sphinx actually was built by Jedifrey. Jeffrey. To honour their father, Khufu. Because the Sphinx is meant to look more like Khufu than Carfrey. Yeah, totally see the resemblance. Maybe the sculptor was having an off day that day. Jedifrey, uh, no, that's been done. Stop. Jedifrey reigned until 2558 BC, so that would make the Sphinx 50 years older if he had built it. But there's a possibility the Sphinx was actually built by Khufu. So that would have been between 2589 and 2566 BC, so adding 100 years onto the estimated build date. But given that we're talking 4000 years ago now, what's 100 years between friends? You would think something as massive as the Sphinx would have been built the same way as the pyramids. By aliens. Oh, no, not aliens. Block by block, by hand, over the course of many years. But no, it's actually carved out of one massive piece of limestone. The two lion paws are separate blocks of limestone, but again, single pieces. It's believed the limestone is left over from the same quarry where they got the stone for Carfrey's pyramid, because it matches the geological profile of the pyramid's blocks. They found unprocessed stone blocks, tools, and even workman lunches at the site, so it's possible the Sphinx build was abandoned in a bit of a hurry. Although, no one knows why. So what were they having? A Mackey's? A cheeky Nando's? Surely not a Taco Bell. Although that would explain why the site was abandoned in a hurry. <laughs> Actually, they found a beer jar and meat from cattle and goats. So a pint and a beef sandwich, maybe? Egyptologist Mark Lehner estimates it took around 100 workers approximately three years to finish the monument, using chisels and hammers, and the workers would have been housed in a kind of barracks. 
evidence shows they ate well. So the theory is that instead of being built by slaves, as our school textbooks told us, it's more likely the Sphinx and the Temple Complex and the Pyramids were actually built by regular citizens, possibly in some kind of national service arrangement. So the first thing that strikes you about the Sphinx is... The fact that someone decided the place needed a 66-foot-tall Lion Man hybrid statue? No, but to think of it, the pharaohs did have weird notions about what a good idea looked like. Look at the Sphinx's head. It's a bit out of proportion, isn't it? I mean, look at that thing. It's got a really tiny little melon compared to the mahoosive body it's sitting on. Do you think the pharaoh that built it would have spent all that time, effort, money on a statue that looks like a ninth grader's art project? These guys managed to build stone pyramids hundreds of feet high with astonishing mathematical precision. There's no way they would have miscalculated the size of a statue's head compared to his body like that. Unless it was the aliens that built the pyramids, which is why they turned out great, and the Sphinx sucked a bit. Oh, I've got to stop you going to CrossFit with Hecklefish. So the theory is the head was actually recarved over the years as fashions changed. I didn't know statues had fashions, but apparently they do. There's some really interesting scientific papers on this subject. I'll link to them in the description for those who want some light bedtime reading. But the overriding thinking seems to be that the Sphinx originally had the head of a jackal, or a lion, which over time was replaced with heads of the pharaohs. What a handsome devil. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd like that one. Scientists have examined the layers of rock that you can see on the Sphinx and worked out that if the current head was original, it would be significantly more weathered than it is. But did you know that the Sphinx was originally painted? There's remnants of red paint on its ears, and the scientists also found traces of yellow on the headdress and blue paint on the body. So the poor old Sphinx used to look a bit like a toddler let loose with a sharpie. Ugh, that's enough to haunt anyone's dreams. And speaking of dreams, did you know the Sphinx got itself rediscovered by haunting a pharaoh's dreams? Sure it wasn't just too much cheese before bed? Apparently not. So the story goes that Prince Tutmos went out for a jolly in the desert, got a bit knackered, and decided to have a nap in the sand next to the Sphinx. As you do. Anyway, in his dream, the Sphinx appeared, called itself Horam Arket, and having a right old grumble about the condition it was in. It promised to give him the throne if he promised to restore the statue to its former glory. Well, Tutmos wasn't a fool, and figured that a bit of spackle and getting handy with a trowel was worth being pharaoh, so he agreed. The archaeologist I mentioned earlier, Mark Lehner, found evidence of tile renovations dating to about 3,400 years ago, so clearly Tutmos did as he was told by the dream sphinx. Considering he became Pharaoh Tutmos IV in about 1400 BC, the Sphinx must have kept up its end of the deal too. When he became Pharaoh, he built a chapel between the Sphinx's paws and had a 12-foot granite stele carved with the story of the dream. Interestingly, it shows the Sphinx with a Pharaoh's head and a big beard. In a surprise twist to the tale, Tutmos's mummy was excavated from the Valley of the Kings in 1898, Extensive examinations and reconstructions were made of it, and scientists concluded that Tutmos suffered from familial temporal epilepsy. This would have explained his early death in his late 20s, but also may have resulted in hallucinations and hearing voices. You know, like a big-ass statue asking you to get it repaired so you become king. Now, when you think of the Sphinx, you see it out in the desert surrounded by sand, but it wasn't always out in the Sahara. Scientists think that about 8,500 years ago, the Giza area was actually rolling grassland and green valleys. The climate started shifting towards the end of the Old Kingdom era, so about 2000 BC, according to Judith Bunbury, a geologist at Cambridge University. Things started getting drier with less rain and more sand as the monsoon belt moved back to the tropics. So at one point in history, the Sphinx would have been sat in lovely green gardens in amongst the temple complexes that surrounded the statue. There would have been trees and probably flowers all over the place. That sounds nice. Yeah, doesn't it? Quite different to how we think of ancient Egypt being all desert with the occasional Nile flood. Goes to show we should remember that just because things are away right now, that doesn't mean they've always been that way. I reckon us humans have a tendency to forget things change, and we like to look at everything through today's eyes. Don't you be getting all philosophical on me. Studies of the Sphinx show that intermittent wet periods cause the salt in the limestone to dissolve and recrystallize, meaning the softer stone was scoured away and the harder stone just flaked off. The increased desert conditions would have been like taking a scrub daddy to the statue. So whilst it used to be standing tall with all the lush greenery around it, it's currently still being eroded at a terrifying rate. Illegal sewage dumping has raised the water table in Giza and chunks of limestone are dropping off at an alarming rate. So poor old Sphinxy's got a nasty case of limestone eczema. 
Couple that with the vibrations and planes, machinery and the nearby city of Cairo, plus some sketchy restoration work involving concrete over the years, it's a bit of a race against time to see if the Great Sphinx will survive another 4,000 years. So that'll do it. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, please promise the subscribe button the throne of Egypt if it empties the kid's sandpit, but in fact take it to see the fake Sphinx at the Luxor Hotel in Vegas. Ugh, jeez, that really does not get any easier to look at, does it? I'm Obi. You know Tut. Sphingo, my dudes. And you've been in Tut's world. See ya!